go. All right. Hi, everyone. Howdy. Wow, I sound really bad. <laughs> Sorry for the next 45 minutes. You're going to listen to my lovely voice. So thanks for coming back from lunch, wherever that was, or d breakfast, or waking up. <laughs> um, today we're going to talk about painting a company red and blue, which is uh, a slightly less sexier red team talk. Uh, we're going to see some pwnage, so I'm going to look good and all that stuff, but it's not about, oh, look at me, or oh, look at how I broke into this and that. It's about looking at the other side as well and trying to actually provide value, I know, crazy, to whoever hired you to do the, your, your crazy shit. Um, so I'm in, uh, I do security, have been in this messy business for over, over 15 years, I'm, I'm tired of counting. Uh, currently director of uh, services for IO Active where I actually have a chance to, to do all this fun stuff. Um, I don't have an intro slide with all my credentials because I have none. So thanks DerbyCon for having me. Uh, a few things first. Before we talk about red teaming, we have to understand what red teaming is not. Okay? So for everyone who, who has red teaming on their marketing stuff, this is not a glorified pen test. Okay? I'm sorry if it doesn't include certain elements. It is not a red team. You can call it a red team if you want. Oh my God. Hey, Dave. Hey, buddy. Yes. I got a group. Thank you. <laughs> this is going to help. Yes. It's warm. <laughs> this is disgusting. Horrible, horrible taste. But it's Kentucky, what do you expect? <laughs> so again, it's not glorified pen testing. No matter how hard you try and how much ninja whiz bang shit you have in your glorified pen testing, it is not red teaming. A red teaming engagement is by definition covering certain areas, like all three main elements of a threat, which is social, physical, and electronic, all right? And electronic, not exclusively electronic. So when you look at, at a red team engagement, you really should look. Hello, folks. I'm Geek here. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties, and the app media seems to have frozen up here, and we don't get any more live video or audio until slightly before the four minute mark. So just hang in there. Compliance is not the answer, all right? To be compliant, you can just run a Vaughn scan or some stupid pen test. Uh, look for the cheapest solution for that because if compliance is what worries you, deal with that, all right? If compliance is your risk for the business, just take care of that risk and check off the boxes and, and get it over with. Uh, compliance is never a good reason to, to run a pen test. Um, and again, if, if you look at pen testing, and you're trying to figure out who am I going to defend from, it is not from a pen tester. All right? This is where a lot of pen testing uh, engagements are flawed, is that they train you, all right, the company who's taking this, to deal with a pen tester. Which, again, it's great if your adversary is pen testers. I, I, I have yet to run into a company whose adversaries are pen testers. Right? They're usually criminals or competitors, and they act in completely different ways. 
And that's really the value of, of red teaming. It's that ability to go beyond click, click, click. I'm a pen tester. I have a, a, a rules of engagement and, and some ethics, and this is what I provide, um, and really go beyond that. So if, if, if I put, try to put these on a scale, vulnerability assessments, all right, that's great to kind of know what, what I have right now. Pen testing, how bad is it? How bad is each vulnerability from a technical perspective, and how far can I get using that? And if you turn on the volume all the way, we're talking about red teaming, which is, again, full adversarial, adversarial simulation. So how do I fare up in a global context of a business, not a technology department, uh, versus an adversary? Uh, so again, compliance is great, doesn't really matter. Okay, remember that. Uh, we use compliance a lot as a driver to get funding for more interesting shit to do in the company. All right, that's great. That's hacking the, the business. Um, IT, again, it's, it's fantastic. I, I love all the focus on technology and systems and applications and mobile apps and connectivity and all that stuff, but red teaming is really breaking out of that, you know, of the matrix and understanding that we have a bigger context. And that's critical, again, critical in understanding uh, how that works. So now that we kind of got the basics laid down of what's a red team and why do we do it, um, and we have enough reasons, the first task is to get a red team. And again, that's not, that's not trivial. Uh, getting a bunch of pen testers to red team you is probably not a good idea. Uh, and the reason is that you need a team that can cover all three circles that, that I've shown before on that Venn diagram that can do, you know, adversarial actions in those contexts and that can play well together to simulate what a real adversary would do. Uh, so when we look for a red team, we're looking for different skill sets across different people to assemble that team. So that's, you know, that's it's a good example to kind of gauge each person's skill set in, in a certain area. Uh, so I'm going to read it from behind. Bob can be, you know, an expert physical security guy. Uh, he's got some basic, basic electronics and, and social is like, eh, not so, not, not so good. Joe, on the other hand, is a great social engineer. He's got, you know, he's got the, the, the physical security stuff laid out. Not so great on electronics, and and you you kind of get the point, right? It's it's all about finding the right mixture of people in the team that will simulate the adversary that you care about. And again, it goes back to you as a business or us as consultants approaching a business, trying to understand who they're really trying to protect themselves from, and based on that, assembling that that team. Uh, the second point after getting a team in place is understanding the context. Uh, I like to say that at, at the end of a, every red team engagement that, that at least I had a chance to run, I knew the business better than 90% of the people who worked at that business. And that includes executives, managers, whoever you want. It includes the guys who, who worked there for like 15, 20 years. You know the business better than them. And the only reason is that you as an adversary have to learn how that business operates. And you have to break out of, you know, that narrow IT perspective or narrow audit perspective. You have to look at everything. Uh, which leads me to, to threat modeling, which is the first part of, of proper red teaming. And it's understanding who the threat is and what is it threatening on, all right? What are the assets of that business that are valuable, all right? What, what makes this business operate and generate revenues, and all of that is is the basic basic red teaming. Uh, so if if you're not offering that in your red team services, or you're not being offered this as part of a red team engagement, go back and re-educate yourself or your red team that's uh, that's supposedly going to to red team you. Um, after we did some threat modeling, again, the focus is not on vulnerabilities. It's not about finding that heart bleed or bash or, uh, or PHP bug or whatever it is in, in an obscure application. It's about understanding what is the risk, okay? 
And it's critical. The a simple PHP bug can mean the world for a company that relies on a specific web application to, to run its business, and it can mean nothing to a company who just, you know, clicks a button and re-images that, that web server, and it's done, because they don't care about it. It's just a, you know, it's just a facade for a company, right? It's a big poster for them. Uh, so understanding risk and how it's formulated and how it's articulated inside a business, critical. Now that you've mapped out the assets, you know who the adversaries are, your role as a red teamer is to act like it. Okay, and again, a quick reminder, actual adversaries do not have rules of engagement. They do not have scope, all right? Uh, which means first order of business is how do I make this business go out of business? All right, this is the first hit. Um, this is the first rule, sorry. You don't start messing around, I mean, compare it to, to a boxing fight, all right? You don't sp start sparring and, and playing around, you just, bam, game over. You go for a knockout on the first hit. Um, what takes the business down, focus on that, all right? What's the biggest assets that, that, that's gonna make me rich and them poor, go for it. If you don't have that in mind, you're making so, you're, you're doing something wrong. Uh, and this is really where, where the difference between pen testing uh, and red teaming comes into play. All right, uh, another analogy that, that my Krav Maga instructor likes to, likes to say is, oh, you do martial arts, cute. Do you take any other dance classes? It's all about effective, quick, down and dirty, and it's game over. Again, rules versus no rules. All right, all the, the karate bullshit, and oh, I got a knife, I'm gonna kill you. How do you deal with that? Second rule, let's say you do go for the juggler. Give it all you have. It's not about, you know, kind of trying to find what's the distance and, and how big is the guy. You go all out, and I'm gonna quote another, uh, well, there are no Israelis in the room, so I'm just going to quote it. <laughs> um, you give it all you've got at the beginning. All right, this is how to swim a 100-meter dash. You give it all you've got at the beginning and then slowly accelerate. Okay, there's no going back. There's no, you know, trying to feel out. Uh, and that's really the essence of red teaming. It's not, you know, you're not going to see port scanning and you know, knocking on, on different areas of the app, you're just gonna see the attack, bam. And it's all about the intel gathering before and the threat modeling that, that the attacker has done before and then launch the attack. There's no, you know, there, there's no point of letting the enemy know or the company that we're attacking them that we're attacking them. So let's paint, okay, let's look, and this is really the, the gist of the, this presentation, let's look at a few examples of, that I've, I've sporadically taken from different red team engagements um, and really focus about what it, what's the ROI. I'm sorry for using the business term, but what's the, what's the value for the company that we did the red team for? Okay, and let's see really how can we translate it, and this is our role as red teamers, as attackers, to help them translate, this is what I did, this is what it means to you as a company. So we'll, we'll just paint by examples, all right? First, first example, uh, we, we, we didn't even go beyond Intel gathering here. All right, this is pure OSINT. Uh, we basically doxed a whole lot of employees of the company and got to understand the, let's call it the, the, the social element of how that company works from the inside. Because we managed to figure the salary ranges, and in this example, a salary range for, uh, what is it, programmer, analyst, or whatever it is, like thousands of jobs inside the company. Uh, and as you can see, the salary range is, is pretty significant. It's almost double when you look at the bottom and the top of, of that range. And further digging into social profiles and creating profiles on, on a lot of people in the company, we came to understand that this is because of a high turnaround 
in the company. They were hiring a lot of college kids and firing them after you know a couple of years, basically just going through them. And there's a bunch of elderlies that were in the company for like 10, 15 years, probably at the high end of the salary. Now imagine working in a company where your peers could be either college graduates or people who are getting paid twice what you're getting paid for the same job. And they're probably doing half of it. All right, so there's a lot of social tension that helped us understand how to attack or how to craft an attack on that specific level of employees. And again, this is all open source intelligence. We haven't even touched anyone uh, before that. An additional element that uh, we managed to, to create while social profiling and creating dossiers as, on executives was uh, creating full hijacking profiles on the CEO and, and a few executives. And that really freaked him out as well, because I know who your kids are, who your wife is, what's your daily schedule, where did they go to school, who picks them up, where did they go afterwards, what's your wife's hobbies, uh, when, when, when does she go to the gym, and when does she go to see her friends, and like full dossier um, to create leverage. Because this is, again, this is what an attacker would do in certain companies, and this company was, was a good example of someone who would want to create leverage on those. So from a red team perspective, we really simulated how an attacker would profile the company. Right? We created personal profiles and identified weak social points. Again, going back to those analyst developers. Now from a blue team perspective, it's not all about, oh my god, you just did what to my CEO? Or, oh, you found that we have you know, a lot of range in our salaries? It's about, understand, first of all, understanding what information is public. Surprisingly, a lot of companies do not know what's their social profile or public profile online. They just think that, oh, we have a website. That's our online presence, right? We have a website and a blog and maybe 10Ks that we publish, and that's about it. But no, it's really understanding the full breadth of online presence and how that affects their risk posture. Second of all, it's really to train key personnel on how to act on their personal safety. Mr. CEO, no, you cannot keep checking on Foursquare every morning in your Starbucks. Why? Because it creates a very easy to use pattern. All right, you cannot tag your kids on your public Facebook profile that is accessible to everyone because that creates a problem. All right, you are a liability to the company. All right, your, your executive protection program should take that into account because right now it doesn't. And you're just shooting information everywhere. And really work with HR on social issues that might have been created because of business decisions. All right, yes, we had to get rid of a lot of people because we're in a downtime. And now we're growing again, so we're hiring a lot of college grads. How do you deal with that social tension inside and Again, we've kind of shown using that context and building social, fake social profiles, we managed to get in and affect a, a, a lot of people to click on, on, on all sorts of things and, and get into the company. So again, red team, woo! I've got your CEO on DOS here and I know where his, you know, where his wife goes to, to do uh, Pilates. Blue team perspective, okay, this, this is what we need to deal with, map it out, and take action on it, very simply. Who knows what this is? There's lights in my eyes, I can't see shit. Yes. Good. It's, it's a wireless access point from Aruba that has a VPN back to the corporate. Uh, this was part of a red team where we, we really struggled with attacking uh, a certain office and its wireless environment. And what we said is, all right, it, it's all conf configured perfectly, really. They used all the best practices, it's nailed down, didn't, didn't get a chance to, to hammer it out. So we went out for the supply chain and managed to grab one of these in transit to, to a remote office where it would be installed and everything is pre-configured. Um, grabbing one of those made it fairly simple to open up the configuration, uh, dump you know, the, 
the support file and config file and from it extract the connectivity information that VPN back to headquarters. Create a fake, you know, a, an alternate OpenVPN on Linux and bam, we're in. Very simple. All right, again, the wireless configuration, nailed down perfectly. Aruva, by the way, fixed this. They're not, you know, if you try to dump a config file and support file again from their wireless access points, they do not have the, the keys in there the way they had it before. Uh, so that's, you know, sorry. <laughs> Can't do that again. Uh, but again, it's, it's all about going for the supply chain and understanding how that affects the company back. So quickly recapping from a red team perspective, we went for a supply chain. It's not about hammering on that, you know, and the same old attack vector and attack surface. It's, it's understanding that the company operates on many different levels and they're not all technology. Um, it's about piercing the perimeter paradigm. Again, very strong focus on creating a perimeter and maintaining it. But once I'm in, I was, I was in all the way. Um, again, VPNing straight into the, the environment, everything was open. And the third thing is, you know, we created an access point, right, an ingress point that should have been monitored and locked down. I mean, it kind of makes sense for a company to make sure that every incoming VPN connection is what it is, all right? And me connecting from an AWS instance doesn't fit the pattern of, you know, this is supposed to be a Verizon or a T-Mobile or whatever it is, a connection from, from a certain geographical area. From a blue team perspective, how do we apply this knowledge? Well, first of all, when, IT, when your IT controls are solid, you have to go beyond the technology. And, and again, this is where, where most companies struggle. IT is IT. Physical is physical, HR is HR, no one talks to anyone, and it's, you know, the, the silo approach is dead. It's not going to work, especially when, when you're attacking someone. So go beyond the technology and try to understand how your perfectly configured access points are deployed, right? How do we ship them? Do we ship them securely? Do we know that they actually got to where they were supposed to go, right? Are we monitoring? you know, an access point going up, creating a VPN, and making sure that it is what it is and no one actually got in the way. Expand monitoring towards the unknown. Again, is this VPN connection valid? Shouldn't come from AWS. Uh, and internally, once we pierce the perimeter, it's really understanding that we need much more role-based access controls over assets because we can just run through everything. Okay, so again, it's breaking that perimeter paradigm in making sure that they understand security needs to go, you know, this is truly a layered security and not just, you know, buzzwords. Yeah, yeah sorry. Next example, someone knows what this one is. I'm trying to challenge you with, with equipment that, that are not your usual element. Anyone? No. Okay, Dave, Dave must know what this is. This is a control panel from a TV studio. Ha ha, Dave. Yeah, uh, yeah well, <laughs> yeah, I forgot that the VIP entrance just skips the whole. So this is a control panel that we, uh, as part of Red Team for, for a news organization, for a media outlet, uh, we managed to compromise at some point. Uh, News and media in general are, are extremely fun. They have the wicked, like wicked cool technologies that range from super old shit to brand spanking new technology. And they just mix everything together and everything works. It's, it's, it's truly IT by ma magicians. Uh, this is another element in that environment that we managed to, to compromise. This one is uh, uh, flex control network. This basically is, is kind of a mini ICS control panel. Um, a lot of equipment in use uh, these days is, is automated, like with little robots. Uh, most cameras aren't, aren't manually operated anymore. They're all remote and pre-programmed for, for a show. Uh, so this is the stuff that controls it. This controls audio 
patching of multiple sources, anything from media clips to, you know, our correspondent in New York, you know, in the storm, uh, from the field, blah, 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 blah. So this is the, the audio patching. Um, some more audio stuff uh, we found on the broadcast station that they had there. Uh, and again, full control over the, the control panel. Uh, this is, this is a, an application from the, I think the 80s or 90s. Uh, really bad, no security at all. Um, and just, you know, we, we just ran through so many different technologies once we managed to get in uh, that our learning experience was, was phenomenal because <laughs> we really had to understand what everything does. And one of my pen testers was like, Ian, I can have my own reality show because I control the studio right now. It's like lighting, cameras, the whole thing. And light, by the way, lighting is, is awesome because uh, you can affect, I mean, it really affects people. It can get really hot if you, if you wanted to. So red team, blue team, what, what did we go through there? Uh, from a red team perspective, we found a lot of undocumented assets, right? Things that were in testing, like this, this uh, the flex control, not the flex control, the, whoop, the red one, it was actually in testing. You know, they were piloting that in this specific studio before they rolled it out across uh, the rest of the organization. Uh, so all these things were, you know, some of them were full production, some were testing. Um, so we really, you know, got a hold of, of a lot of different assets there. Uh, and they didn't know about them. I mean, if you talk to the managers, they're like, oh, no, that we don't have that. But it's being used in this specific studio. Um, controlling the environment is key. Again, for anyone who's, who's ever dealt with SCADA or ICS or, or production lines, knows that making something move or change the environment, all right, or make this AC stop freezing my ass, or, you know, making an operating room hot, all right, and turning up the, the heat to like 120 degrees is going to kill someone. Affecting environmental changes goes a long way. And if I can make the lights in the studio flare up and send a phishing email, you know, to a few of the studio executives saying, you know, uh, oh yes, we've heard that there are problems with, with you know, the, the, the light controls. We're going to send a technician the next day or someone is coming to the studio right now because we understand this is critical. Makes it super easy to someone, for someone to pick up the phone because reception just called and there's a, you know, weird looking technician that claims he's from lighting and grant him access to the facility. Okay, so again, environmental changes in a red team perspective, lends well to what we talked about before, physical, social, electronic, and then I just walk in, plug something into the network, and I have more access. Uh, last but not least, again, com combining those, well, I, I said that. Uh, from a blue team perspective, uh, it, it's really expanding the, the, my control and monitoring base into everything that the business does. All right, lighting is not out of scope. Okay, it is a production issue. They have special technicians for it. They have their own IT. And it wasn't under, you know, this and that company's IT uh, uh, organization's responsibility. Because it's lighting, it's studio. You know, it's not computers and, and databases. So you really have to, to, again, break down that silo approach and merge those uh, responsibilities together. Uh, it was super important for that organization in terms of recruiting stakeholders. Again, coming back from a red team like this with those kind of results helped them expand the, the risk management reach across the organization. All right? and, and it got back all the way to the CEO who saw this. We made it abundantly clear how to fix those things in terms of investment and changing how the organization works from the inside, and that actually happened. And that's fantastic. Uh, and again, learn from other business units. It's, it's not about this, you know, this is my IT with my databases and my scripts and my, you know, uh, uh, scheduling for who's coming in, who's coming out. It's about all the other elements that surround us that are part of the business. One more example. Um, this is easy, all right? Everyone has seen that, I'm sure, in, in some some point, this is a Dell DR 
um, storage. And this specific one is called uh, DRX4000, I think. Yeah. And X here stands for exchange. Um, this was really challenging for us. Again, we were facing a fairly nailed down IT security uh, infrastructure. Couldn't get to the exchange server. It was very hard getting into uh, Active Directory. We were just banging our heads trying to figure out how do we get in until we found that we don't have to go for the exchange if it's backed up on a server in another facility that's way easier to access. So I'm just not going to try anymore, all right? Because for me, the best path is path of least resistance. Very zen. And path of least resistance brought us to this, uh, to this backup server. It was just, just open with default credentials. Again, it's a different IT organization in a different facility, but that's where the backup goes. Uh, and I just dumped, dumped the database. All right? I don't need access. I don't need users. Nothing. Now I have everything. Uh, this is another, another example. Uh, this is how we got the Active Directory itself by uh, accessing the power vault, you know, once you realize what kind of security is done on the on the backup side, it's fairly easy to find more more assets and just you know pull tapes of, of backups from a month ago, from a week ago, from whenever you want. Red team, super easy, access critical assets out of their element. The fact that you know that you know you have an exchange server and exchange data is great, and you're protecting it, you did a fantastic job, but you completely left out the fact that this asset, asset doesn't just sit there by itself, all right? It has backup, it has life beyond what you think you're responsible for, uh, and on the blue team side is the understanding that you have to follow that wherever it goes. Do you know where your backups go when they go off-site or to another server? Do you know what kind of security controls are around them? How about trying to find out and make sure that if you really focus on asset-based security and risk management, you really follow through on that and not just leave it on the technical side of your realm. Um, and from our perspective, again, when attacking an off-site solution, we just avoided banking on you know, the hardcore security that was on the main site. Okay. Again, much easier, and from a blue team perspective, how about correlating all those logs that you have on your main site with the backup site to gain some insight on who's trying to do what? Especially if you see something fishy on a main site and then the same kind of approach on a different site, that's huge threat intelligence. There, I said it that you're never going to be able to buy from any of the vendors because it's your threat intelligence. So build something that works for you and actually gain an insight into your security posture. I think this is our last example, hopefully. Um, this, this is a sonic wall firewall with a little access point like UTM device. This, this was really interesting because when we came back to the company and said, we, you know, we have this sonic wall firewall, blah, 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 we, I have root on it. I was like, I'm, whoo, I'm the man. And they're like, uh, no, it's not ours. A, it's not in scope. B, we, it's not, you know, it's not ours. We don't have that in our environment. And I, I run back. I'm like, oh shit, we fucked up this time. Um, and I'm like, but, but the IP schema looks the same. You know, it's got the same configuration. I, I managed to access a lot of shit using that device on your network. So something's weird. Go back and forth and back and forth. And then we, they, they realized that they were testing this, again, pre-production on the production network. But they're just testing this. Again, this is not a you know, complete full configuration. We had VPN configured on it to connect us back in. <laughs> and if we wouldn't have told them what we did and how far we went, this would have went to production as is with our, you know, back door in it. Yeah, I shit you not. Super fun. 
Okay? You have access straight into the environment using a VPN on a firewall that someone deployed without going through full test to production procedures from a security perspective as well. So again, from my perspective, awesome. I get non-production equipment, all right, and I'm rooting it before it gets to production. Bam. From their perspective, it's really understanding how you put things in production. So yes, if it works on testing, okay, and you've finally got a configuration that, that works for you from a network segmentation and all that fun stuff and wireless access points, good. Now you have to run it through, you know, test to production process that includes some form of physical, of, of security review to figure out if all the configuration is correct. Because as you know, when we, you know, configure something, we make a lot of mistakes and we go, we go back and forth and back and forth and we don't necessarily fix up the configuration on the errors that we've made before. Uh, so getting that process scrutinized and actually implemented was key for these guys because they just didn't have it. They trusted, and again, trust is a big, big thing in risk management, they trusted the testing and the configuration procedure to be solid. Not if someone compromises you. Uh, this one, oh, yeah, I had to add this one. This is one of my favorites. Uh, again, why try to own server by server an environment where you can just own the, the entire thing? Uh, out of band management, for in this example, for Blade Server, is awesome because you get full access to whatever the fuck you want, including KVM, you can reboot it, you can get BIOS access. Love it. Absolutely love it. And while the security on your production network may be super ninja with all the blinky lights that you can afford, a lot of times that single cable dangling out of the back of the server that says out of band management or ILM or whatever they're, they're called, not really the same security, all right? It usually goes to like a, a separate segment of the network that only the IT guys or, or uh, the NOC guys can connect to. But that's usually where it ends, and that's too bad. Because if I can compromise that, I have access to everything. Uh, again, a lot of fun was had there, especially when, when, when again, you can affect physical things in their environment. So I can shut down a server and it just goes poop and then turn it back on and then shut it down. And someone is at the data center looking at it and is like, what the fuck's going on? And again, you can make a call and say, I, I, I see that you have a problem with this, this and that. I'm calling from Dell support or IBM or whatever it is. It seems to be a problem with our latest revision of blah, 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 blah. I'm going to send you a file, right? with a firmware update that's going to fix it. Do you see the problem on your end? Bloop. Yeah, it went down again. Super easy. It's like cheating, but, but not really. Um, so again, from a Red Team perspective, attacking virtualized environments made easy. All right, go out of band and, and have fun with infrastructure. Bypass host security completely. I don't care what you've installed on those VMs and servers. You can have the most ninja security software looking for behavioral issues of users and network traffic and looking what, what's the position of the stars at any given time. Doesn't matter. I'm coming in from behind, honey. Oh, shit. Don't quote me on that. Um, from, from a blue team perspective, why are you laughing, Dave? <laughs> Remind you of something? <laughs> From a blue team perspective, again, data center security is physical as well as internal and vendor support. It's, it's, it goes across different, different, different assets in, inside and different attack approaches. And logging and auditing access to your assets. Again, if you consider the VM an asset or what's stored on the VM an asset, but you have another means of getting to that asset that you haven't mapped out, you have a problem. You can put as many controls and mitigating controls as you, you, your heart's desire on that VM logically, but you haven't secured access to it, you're still fucked. 
And again, an attacker is not going to spend his time trying to find a, you know, a, a VM bypass or, or some Zen vulnerability when they can just access the thing from, from the back end, from out of, out of band management. So how does blue team work really works, all right? Uh, and, and again, I'd like to debunk some, some myths here. Uh, they're not all like this, especially when, when, when we run red teams. Red team is, is usually not run an organization that's, sure, we just built our this and that, and you know, let's, let's, let's do a red team. Yeah, what the hell. Uh, a red team is usually run an organization that's, that's fairly, fairly mature in its uh, uh, security posture because it can actually understand and implement recommendations from, from a red team result. Uh, and one of the good examples that, that I can uh, actually point out is, is running a red team is the efficiency of a blue team when it, when it does get to that maturity level, all right, of focusing on assets, on processes, and people rather than just install an AV or a firewall. Uh, this is a phishing example from uh, a highly targeted uh, attack that we launched on, on an organization. Uh, there's an RSVP to some, uh, and again, this is highly specific to, to a certain office, a certain location, a certain point of time where things were happening there, and it was like, we were like, ooh, this is awesome, you know, we, we've nailed down all the intel gathering and this is going to work. Well, it didn't. We really got fucked. Ten minutes into this, the first person who got the email, like the first five people who got the email alerted security on it, pretty fucking good, and they shut us down, like immediately. They analyzed this, figured out who is it going to, what's the payload behind it, what's the story behind it, did full IR uh, analysis on it, and just shut it down. Yeah, that was beautiful. And, and the reason it was beautiful is that, again, they were focused on ass assessing the situation involving other, other stakeholders. It wasn't the security team that found it. It was just one of those employees or a few of those employees that were targeted, which means they had some insight into this looks, this doesn't look legit, okay? And it's not just, oh, let's, it, yeah, click, 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 let's see what's behind it. It was really quick action behind it. And again, minimizing damage, controlling the environment, making sure, really assessing who is this going to, right? Let's segment them out. So if someone did click something, let's try to monitor those, you know, with, with more scrutiny to find out if, if they actually clicked, did it work, did it not work. In parallel, get the forensics and IR teams to figure out what's the, you know, what's the payload and, and how do we actually learn from this going forward. This, this was not, you know, the specific blue team's first, you know, first rodeo. This is like the second or third red team, it, which made me really happy because I was like, damn, shut down. We're going to have a, to up our game or try to find other adversaries that they're, they're dealing with and simulate those or see if we, you know, if we need to change something on our side to make it more challenging for them or more relevant for them on other areas of, of attack. Okay, so again, this, this is the key slide basically on the blue team side, um, is really assessing, involving other parties, controlling and minimizing damage, and moving on to learn from it. Trigger warning. I'm gonna say the bad, bad words that the big man told you not to listen to. Uh, we are get all getting paid at some point, okay? This is not just for our fun of playing with computers. Sorry to break your bubble. Uh, so everything that we do has to work somehow from a business perspective to the organization that we're, we're working for or we're hired to work for. And a big problem that I hear a lot of my peers face is how do we justify it? How do we sell it to management? Because sometimes the work that we do is irrelevant and they're right. You can't justify it. You need to make a little shift in what you're dealing with, all right? Or no, you can't justify it because you keep dealing with IT 
and you forget that the business has you know other things to to worry about than your five Linux servers sitting in a basement. Uh, and the key here is really to to show return on investment. Uh, fortunately, from a red team perspective, it's it's easier because you're really addressing the problem at, at a business level and not at a technology level. Okay, again, if you focused on technology, you're fucked at this point because it's like, yeah, buy more stuff. I don't know, which doesn't work, right? Uh, it's about fixing processes and people and technology, or at least a addressing the gaps that we find in process, people, and technology by that order a lot of times. And, and the key is to show over time how investing in the red team side turns back, as, as I've shown in the last example, into something that I can show my executives, see, this is a risk, all right? This is what the risk is composed of. This was my adversary, and this is how I dealt with it. Right? And we all know, you know, because of, of the risk models that they've used, this was their potential damage if we haven't mitigated that risk, which is fairly easy. Again, if you have a proper threat model and risk, uh, risk framework, it's easy to show the numbers behind what happens. Okay, and then reapply that to the organization to make it keep growing and improving on its risk posture. So when you play the numbers game, hack it. By all means, this is what we do. This is what we are. We're hackers. So learn to work with that terminology. Learn to work with their risk models and sit with their auditors and CFOs and whoever it is to understand how they do risk management. Talk that same language and turn it back to them. Like, here, it's your numbers, it's your formulas. I work within there. Here's how I fixed something for you. Or here's how we can improve something and save you money. Retest and verify. If a red team is a singular event, something is wrong. Because there is no way that our organization a, assessed everything it needed in one red team engagement, and B, fixed everything that was found and is now good forever. The key is to reapply the same testing and methodology, and, and everyone who went to our uh, red team class knows it's all about being able to be repetitive, methodol method methodical, all right? And it's not, you know, it's not a a hat trick. It's not a. It's not magic. Ooh, I managed to do this. Can you replicate it? No. <laughs> Does it apply to other situations? No. Bullshit. Okay. It's about a repetitive methodology that can re you can reapply and retest, and it's going to look different in the next time because the controls have changed, the assets have changed. All right. They actually learned something from the previous time, but you have to repeat the same methodology to test that area again. It's not about clicking run again on your Nessus scanner or Metasploit. It's about doing all that work, mapping, threat modeling, risk framework, and reapplying the mindset of the right threat community back into that same situation. And then deliver. This is the easy part. Okay? Uh, the, your only measure of success is if you deliver the work correctly. Don't try to sell. Don't try to, you know, put it under, oh, this is supposed to work. Or, you know, I've gotten to the I've gotten this far, the rest is trivial. No. Show them that it's trivial. If you cannot prove that you can break it, it is unbreakable as far as I'm concerned. Okay? Don't sell them theory theories and, and research. Sell them proof. If this is breakable, show them that it's breakable. If this is exploitable, exploit it. If this lock is pickable, pick it. If you can't pick it, you can't get in. Very simple. And again, the, the, the only factor on the delivery is success. So please stick to it. Don't, don't unleash your salespeople based on one-offs, all right? And, uh, uh, you know, Shows stunt, stunt hacks. 
Clear? This is all I have for you guys. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Criticism? Yes. Yeah. The, the question was, how do I sell executives on, on the people part of it? Well, it's really easy. Are the people part of the business? Do they make a difference in your revenue stream? The CEO probably is. And it's fairly easy to kind of group the, those people into areas of these people matter, these people matter more, these people matter less. That's going to be the scope. And if I can affect your business by threatening your CEO that I'm going to expose his, you know, his shenanigans in the local strip club that he goes every Thursday on his board meeting and extort him, then yes, it affects the business. And if he doesn't have the right controls around it, you know what? Either stop it, okay, or do something about you know, not exposing yourself to that problem. Both valid solutions from a corporate perspective. Make sense? Cool. Any more questions? All right. I'm going to be around the rest of the day and tomorrow. Thanks.